Welcome to a red letter revolution. If you were here last weekend, you know that we talked about all through 2012, we're going to be focusing on that idea, a red letter revolution, red letter, meaning we're going to be looking at the words of Jesus, the words that are read in those King James Version Bibles, the revolution part being he is a revolution, and he's invited us to join him and partner with him in changing the world, and the love idea that's right there in the middle of that word, meaning we're going to focus all year long on studying how much God loves us and how we can love him back. I'm Dan Sutherland, one of the pastors at Westside. My honor to get to speak for a few minutes today, and we want to say hey to all you folks that are at Lenexa. Hey, Lenexa, glad you're here. And hey to the folks up at Speedway that'll be catching this via live internet hookup. Amazing that they get it even as we get it here. Hey to the guys up on the hill in Lansing. We have services going, if you're not aware of this, both in the maximum security and in the minimum security wards up at Lansing. And our brothers in blue are a big part of what we do here. And hey to everybody out on the internet. This is a growing crowd. In fact, let me pause right here and say to the rest of us, if you have friends around the country or around the world that aren't plugged into a local church and you'd like them to get to see and be part of what Westside is doing, our services are on the net. Every time we're doing service in here, it's on the net as well. And uh, they can join in. We've got folks joining us regularly from China, from uh, Japan, from South Africa. For some reason, on Christmas weekend, we had a ton of folks from India and Pakistan. We're still trying to figure that out, exactly what's going on there. And hey to one other set of folks that are listening today, and that is, I got word this week particularly about some folks that have been in the hospital long term that are still catching us online. want to give a shout out to my good friend Judy particularly and say, get well, girl, and get back here. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, wow, there's a lot going on at Westside. Wow. Tell them. Wow. You hadn't been wowed so far this year. God is doing some wow kind of stuff. Find your notes. We're going to jump in right now. We're going to be studying from the Gospel of John this year. And just working our way through it, we're going to cover one whole verse today. Wow, that's a bunch. Out of John 1, 1. And as we study through, we're going to be looking at three specific questions. We're going to be saying, who is Jesus? What does he say, and what does he do? Now, many folks would say, what did he say, and what did he do? No, 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 no. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what he said 2,000 years ago is what he's saying today. Does that make sense? What he did 2,000 years ago is what he is doing today. We do not serve a God that is dead. We serve a God that is risen from the grave and that is living. And we're going to be focusing on Jesus all through the year. Here's the series we start today. It's called Know Jesus. Do you see it up there? Know Jesus. Now, I've been in church all my life where I've been taught to know about Jesus. <clears throat> Did you catch that? Knowing about Jesus, look this way, church, focuses here. It gives me lots of head knowledge and lots of information and lots of data that I can know about Jesus. It's not about just knowing about Jesus. It's about knowing him. And we're going to talk more about that as we're going on today. But here's the big idea for the series. Write it in. Knowing about Jesus is not the same as knowing Jesus. It's not the same. As a 17-year-old that had been in church all my life, I had a, a conversation one night with our youth pastor and said to her, you've got something I don't have. What do you have? And she had the audacity to look at me and say, I have Jesus. And I said, I've been in church all my life. I know about Jesus. And she looked at me and said, exactly. You know about him. You do not know him. She had the audacity to, to, to then tell me how I could know him and say, I'm going to pray that you won't sleep tonight until you decide to commit your life to Christ and to know him. 
I looked at her and said, lady, nothing keeps me awake at night. At two in the morning, having not slept a moment, I fell out of bed, got on my knees, and prayed the most irreligious sinner's prayer that's ever been prayed with something like this. Jesus, I'm tired of not sleeping. <laughs> got to be honest with God. He knows. If there's something to this knowing about you thing that's more, excuse me, if there's something to this knowing you thing that's more than knowing about you, I want it. I want to know you. I'm giving myself to you. I don't even know how this works. Amen. That's pretty irreligious. But I got up different the next day. I got up different the next day. And three years later, I married that youth pastor. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> it's going to drive you nuts because I'm not going to tell it today. There's a difference in knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. I'm convinced a lot of people in the world know a lot about Jesus but don't know him. You ready for this? And most of them are in church. Most of them are in church. We're here all the time. We want to know him, not just know about him. That's what this series for the next two months is going to be about. Here is the stuff for today. Are you ready? Big idea. There's a difference in knowing Jesus and knowing about him. Here's where we're headed today. Number one, Jesus is God. There's some of you going, well, duh, of course he is. But I'm amazed at how many people aren't crystal clear on Jesus being God. Check out our one verse today, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. Now, stop right there. Circle the Word in your notes. John starts out calling Jesus the Word in his gospel. Now, before you get out of chapter 1, where we'll be headed for the next few weeks, you'll see that he's talking about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, he says, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, since he's clearly talking about Jesus, let's read it that way. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus, are you ready, was God. He is and was and forever will be God. Look down at verse 18, next verse in your notes. It says, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God. I'm flipping through my TV late one night over Christmas, and I catch an amazingly crazy talk show host who may be as anti-God as anybody I've ever listened to, won't use his initials, but his name is Bill Maurer. (laughs) And he says, the Bible never really claims that Jesus is God. What Bible is he reading? Are you kidding I mean, tell me you don't believe that. I'll respect it. But tell me the Bible doesn't claim that Jesus is God only dozens of times, including right here, who is himself God. Check this out, guys. If we are saying Jesus is a good man, no, he's not. No, he's not. That's not enough. If we're saying he's a great teacher, no, it's much more than that. If we're saying Jesus was just a prophet, he's not. We've got to know this. The Bible repeatedly and clearly states that Jesus is God. Now, some of you are going, wow, Dan, this is 101 stuff. Yeah, we know. No, 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 no. Knowing this is essential. Don't miss this, church to everything we do and believe, to everything. Christology 101, Jesus 101 starts with the idea, he is God. We got to know that. Now, to give you some further study this week, I listed some verses in your notes. Do you see them? One of the things we're going to encourage you to do all year long is study ahead and study further. So we thought, let's just put the references right there in your notes. These and dozens of other passages talk about Jesus being God. Let me just highlight a few of them for you. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to my Father except by me. Now, that's pretty narrow, isn't it? Yeah, but when you're God, you get to set the rules. When you're God, you get to set them. And he said, you're not getting all the way to me except in and through Jesus. In John 20, he's called the Messiah. By the way, there's a, there's a, 
a, a typo in here and a couple more. Let me give it to you. In Acts 10, 36, he's called Lord of all. In Acts 20, 21, not 31, change that in your notes. In Acts 20, 21, we're told to turn and have faith in God and Jesus. Okay, hang on. Even our faith is hooked up where God and Jesus are the same. In Romans 6, we are told to be alive to God through Christ Jesus. In Romans 6, 23, I love this, the gift of eternal life, check it out, is Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, biggest word there is, boss. If you're Lord, you are God. In Romans 8, 39, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Romans 15, my service to God is in Jesus Christ. In Romans 16, the only wise God be glory and forever, Christ Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 1, grace and peace to you from God and our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ all together. 1 Corinthians 8, there is one God, one Father, one Lord, one Jesus. It doesn't get any plainer than that. It doesn't get any plainer than that. Second Corinthians, may the grace of Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours. Get all three of them in that one. Gotta love it. All God. Galatians 3, in Christ Jesus you are all the children of God through faith. How are we the children of God? In Christ Jesus. Jesus, Ephesians 2.10, you're God's handiwork created in Jesus. I love that verse. The verse literally, you're God's handiwork. The word is literally poema in the Greek from which we get our word poem. Here's what it means. Are you ready? You're a piece of work. Now, some of y'all been wanting to tell somebody that for a while. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, I've been telling you, you're a piece of work. Go ahead and tell them. You're a piece of work. What kind of work? You're God's work. You're God's craftsmanship. You're God's piece of art. You're God's portrait. You're God's poem. You're God's short story, and he's still writing the story of your faith and your walk with him. In Philippians 2, we will all acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. The Bible says there's going to be a day that every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord. The Bible doesn't claim Jesus is God. Come on. I don't even have time for the next 20 of the references that are in your notes. It is there again and again and again. Dan, why are you worked up? Sutherland, why is this such a big deal? Listen. Because if you settle for knowing about Jesus without knowing him, you miss heaven by 18 inches. The distance from your head to your heart. You can know about him all day long. James says the demons know about him, but they don't know him. To know him means I want you in my life. I surrender me to you. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Thanks, Troy. <coughs> One of the things, <coughs> Troy is getting a bottle of water, which is a wonderful <laughs> thing. Thank you, my brother. One of the things that any of you that have been at Westside long know about me, and apologies, is when I cry, I cannot speak. <laughs> It's just the way my body is wired. If I get teared up, my vocal cords shut down. I do not know why. It frustrates me. But this is that big of a deal. It scares me to death to think that any of us come here week in and week out and listen to the Scripture and we say, yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah, West Side is my church. Yeah, Jesus is pretty cool. And never get it. And never, ever get it. It's about bowing the knee of your life to Jesus. It's about knowing him and surrendering to him and yielding to him and following him and loving him. It is not enough to know about him. Can I give you the difference? I think everybody that's married can grab this. Are you ready? 
You knew about your wife before you got married. You did. You knew about your husband before you got married. You thought you knew him. Did you? Uh uh uh. No way. No way. I mean, I don't know why they call it the honeymoon. They ought to call it the shock the hooey out of you moon. <laughs> Seriously. It's like, really? I signed up for this? Yeah. It's the difference in knowing about versus knowing. We want to know Jesus. Now, why? Why? Point number two, write it in. If you know Jesus, you know God. If Jesus is God, then we got to grab this. Then to know Jesus is to know God. There are dozens, hundreds of reasons that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit made a plan that one of them, God the Son, would come to earth. There's all kinds of reasons that happened. That happened because we needed forgiveness of our sins. That happened because we needed to find our way back to God. That happened because God wanted to say, I love you this much. But one of the other reasons it happened, don't miss this, is so we could see what God was like. told the story to my good friend Mike Grubbs, who's here this week. Mike's my life coach from Charlotte, lifesaver to me. He's sitting right down here in front at Lenexa. If you want to bug him later, he'll be around. In fact, you can coach him on how to coach me. Be a good thing. I was telling Mike about the time when our daughter, Dana, was five years old. And uh, we lived in South Florida. And South Florida is just a place where there's lots of thunderstorms. They're almost always in the late afternoon. I mean, in the summertime especially, between 4 and 5 o'clock, it's going to rain. It's going to rain for 15 or 20 minutes. It's going to make you think the world is ending. And then the sun pops out, and it goes away, and it's amazing. But this particular evening, it was doing that thunderstorm thing about 8.30. And Dana, who at 5 years old was a pro at finding a reason not to go to sleep, got any kids like that, was crying out, Mama, Mama, Mama. And so finally, Mary gets up and goes in there and says, Dana, what is it? And she says, Mama, I'm scared. The lightning is scaring me, Mama. So Dana's sitting there. Mary sits on her bed and says, Honey, you know that God is always going to be with you. And my five-year-old speaks up this quick and says, Yeah, Mama, I know. But sometimes I need God with skin on. God with skin on. That's one of the big reasons Jesus came. God with skin on. God that we could see what the life would look like lived out. God that we could touch. God that would relate to us and we could relate to him. God with skin on. That's literally what the incarnation's about. We're going to be talking about that in a few weeks later in John 1, that God incarnated. He got in a body. He got in flesh. He took skin on. So that when we know Jesus, we know God. Why are we going to center all year on knowing and loving Jesus? How much he loves us and how we love him back. Because that is the way that we know God. Check it out. Look at the verse. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. I left the reference out there. It's John 1.18 if you want to grab it. It's the whole John 1.18, not just the first part we read earlier. Write this in. Jesus came so that we can know God. He wants us to know him. We've had this idea sometimes that God is unknowable, that he's a mystery, that we only get glimpses. He wants to be known. That's why Jesus says later, seek me and keep on seeking and you'll find me. Knock and keep on knocking. I'll answer the door. Ask and keep on asking and I will respond to your prayers. He's the God who wants to be known. And if you know Jesus, you know God. A couple of years ago, my son and I went on our annual lobster trip to South Florida. We free dive for lobsters the last Wednesday and Thursday in July in South Florida in the Keys every year. It's a blast. It's a little weird to be free diving in the same water with 10-foot nerf sharks, but it's kind of cool. 
you pay attention, you're wide awake. He brought a new friend, a new friend he had met the year before. The way this trip works is I go and pay for most of it, and Jared brings all of his buddies. Is this a deal for him or what? So my 28-year-old brings all his football buddies and his work buddies, and Pete shows up this year. And the first day I meet him, Pete shakes my hand and says, I've heard a lot about you, and I've heard that Jared is a lot like you. Good to meet you. When the week ends, he comes up to me and says, Oh, I know you, because I know your son. And you guys are so alike, it is scary. My son was here this Christmas, and one of my buddies who hung out with him for a while said the opposite. Said, wow, Dan, we can tell this is your kid, just like father, just like son. Fruit don't fall far from the tree. Now, the reality is he's complimenting me and insulting my son. (laughs) But we know God because we know Jesus, and they are one and the same. We know the Father's heart because we can know the Son. It is one heart. They are one and the same. Corinthians says there's one Lord, one faith, one God, one baptism. One is the idea here. Point number three, write it in. If you don't know Jesus, then the best you can do is to know about God. I love hanging out in places that aren't necessarily populated just by Christ followers. One of my absolute fun things to do in life is to hang out with people that don't know Jesus yet. And I know today there's some here that are in that category. You're checking it out. You know, you're open. It's first of a new year. You're, uh, you're checking out the Jesus thing, the God thing, the church thing. Welcome. Glad you're here. I will oftentimes have those folks say, So tell me, Dan, you think all the Muslims have got it all wrong and they can't know anything about God? Tell me, Dan, you think the Jewish folks are just missing it? You know? Tell me, Dan, you you know, you think the, the, the folks that believe differently just don't have a clue? And I love this question. I love the setup. I say, oh, I think all religion has good in it. And all religion has some truth about God in it. And all of those paths can get you really close to God. But they're limited because they only let you know about him. To know him, to go the rest of the way, is only possible in Jesus Christ. That's what the Scripture teaches. I've shared this with you guys before. The house that we still own in Charlotte, three and a half years later, because you can't sell a house in Charlotte and get out from under it, is the one where my kids live. And it's in a little development called St. John's Forest. Sounds much more regal than it is. (laughs) You can get close to St. John's Forest a lot of ways. You can take Highway 74 and then Highway 16. You can go down Weddington Road. You can go down Old Monroe Road. You can get close because St. John's Forest is literally this one little development surrounded by a lot of forest and a lot of land. It's kind of a cool spot. Makes you feel like you're in the country even when you're not. We got a few of those places in Kansas City, don't we? Where it just feels like there's a lot of space around you. But if you want to go to my house... There's one road in to that development. It's called St. John's Place Road. You can get close. Oh, you can circle the whole development. You could take, you know, glasses and spy on it. You could set up a telescope and look in. You could fly over it and take aerial pictures. But if you want to get to my house, you got to go down St. John's Road. Why? Because the guy who designed the development, designed it that way. There's one road in, and that's it. Why is Jesus the only full way to God? Because he designed it that way. Bada beam, bada boom. If you think that makes him narrow-minded, talk to him. I'm just the messenger. Last time I checked, if you're designing something and creating something and making something from scratch, 
you make those kind of choices. What would be narrow-minded would be if there was only one way in and he only let certain people in. Uh Uh-uh. What would be narrow-minded would be if there's only one way in and you didn't tell anybody where the one way was. No. He's literally saying, I want you to know God in the fullest. And that's why Jesus is God, and that's why he has come, and that's why he has died, and that's why he's been raised from the dead, and that's why it is essential. Don't just know about Jesus. Know him. Write this in your notes. Let me read this passage first. It's too good to pass up. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. And I love this passage out of Matthew. I don't often read from the message because it's a paraphrase, not a translation. But there are moments where it just knocks it out of the park. One day, Jesus is telling a story about there are going to be people that die and come to heaven and say, Lord, let me into your heaven. And he's going to say, I didn't know you. And they're going to say, yeah, but look at all the good we did and all the things we accomplished and how much we knew about you and how much we did for you. And he's going to say, "Huh, uh you never yielded to me. You never surrendered to me. I never knew you. Check that passage out in the message. I can see it now at the final judgment, thousands strutting up to me and saying, Master, we preached for you. We bashed the demons. Our God-sponsored projects had everyone talking. And do you know what I'm going to say to them? You missed the boat. All you did was use me to make yourselves important. Do not miss that phrase. There's a lot done in the kingdom of God that is not about knowing Jesus. It's about using him in his name to make yourself feel important. You don't impress me one bit. You're out of here. Depart from me. I never knew you. There are many people, write this in your notes, who know a lot about God but do not really know God at all. Don't settle for knowing about him. Know him. Last question, and then a response. Do you know Jesus? He is God, and he is worth knowing. you're sitting here right now at Lenexa, at Speedway, at Lansing, online, wherever you are, and you're wondering, wow, i got to settle this. I, I've got to decide, do I know him or do I just know about him? Great news for you today. You can know him. It's about surrender. Everybody look this way. It's about deciding that you will take your life and do this with it. It's about saying, Jesus, I give all of me to what I know about you. Jesus, you're in charge. Jesus, here I am, good, bad, and mostly ugly. Take me. I want to know you. I want to follow you. I want to love you. I'm tired of just knowing about you. I want to know your power and your fullness and your character. I want to know you. I want to invite you to make that journey today. I want to invite you to start that journey today. I'm going to ask you right now to bow your heads with me. Would you do that? Everybody in the room, I realize we don't have to bow our heads to pray, but it's just so much less distracting when we're in a big crowd. If you'd like to give your life to Christ today, to start that journey of knowing him and not just knowing about him, to nail down this issue, you can pray this prayer with me in your heart silently as I pray it out loud. Jesus, I don't want to settle for just knowing about you. I want to know you. I'm getting on my knees right now, Lord. I'm surrendering my life to you. I'm asking you to take me and change me. Make me like you. I do want to know you, Jesus your character, your power, your direction. I want to love you like you love me. 
So I'm giving everything to you. And I'll follow, Lord. In Christ, I make this prayer. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me right now, I'm going to make a couple of guesses. One, you don't see any angels flying around the room. Two, there's no bells or buzzers going off. And three, real honestly, you may not feel any different than you felt before. When I gave my life to Christ, 17-year-old kid in high school, I didn't feel any different at all. But life changed in the days ahead. If you prayed that prayer with me, or if you'd like to talk with someone today about how you can understand that even better, either group, I want you to do one of two things. I want you to tell somebody, and there's two places you can do it. When we finish in a moment, some of our pastors are going to hang here in the front they're harmless. Trust me, I know them well. Walk up and say to them, hey, I prayed that prayer with Dan. What are my next steps? Or walk up and say to them, hey, I got some more questions about this. Can we talk? They're here to talk with you, pray with you, encourage you. So there'll be some pastors here when we finish 60 seconds from now. And there'll also be some folks over in our next steps area. There's a room that says next steps out here. There's a table outside it. And you just go by there, and they're just normal, everyday folks that have also given their lives to Christ, and they'd love to talk with you or pray with you. So two options, right here in the front, right over there. Either one goes and works. All year long, we're going to have a red letter revolution. We're going to talk and study and pray toward knowing and loving Jesus. It's going to be an amazing year. May the grace of Jesus, who is God, be on you all this week. God bless you, church.